Hello, I'm Ansi CEO of Cocoon and next to me are two beautiful and smart men. Can you please introduce yourself, please? Hello, I'm Risto, COO of Cocoon. And I am Alexander, uh, founding partner of uh, Cocoon Ventures. Um, today we have uh, met uh, in this uh, three-person format. Um, mostly we would like to extract knowledge uh, from Alexander. Um, and uh, me and Christo will be acting uh, in the form of interviewers, but we will see as it goes. This is our first time in such a, a trio format. Um, as we uh, uh, joked a bit in the beginning of the record, uh, we want to start with uh, talking about your childhood, to, to know where you come from, where you are now, and uh, then go into your experience with uh, challenges and takeaways from those. But uh, starting with your childhood, uh, I assume you had one. Yes, so uh, not, me not having one was indeed a joke. Good, good. Uh, can you share what was it like? So, uh, yeah, sure. I actually didn't grow up uh, far from here, so 20 minutes drive, but it's in, in, a, in a much smaller place than, than Tartu. So we, we had about 300 people living in, in the place called Tera, where uh, mostly scientists. And, and then also some of... Uh, let's say, supporting people to the observatory. So, so my father was working as a scientist there, and, and it was uh, fairly, fairly interesting to grow up in that environment. I think that's where my interest to kind of technology and, and physics, uh, even entrepreneurship, uh, comes from. So, so I remember this as a, as a kind of, like almost like a safe haven away from, uh, from, uh, from the city and, and peak places as we didn't lock the doors and, and we, we could all go and, and, and play around the biggest telescope on, on the northern hemisphere if you draw the line through, through, through our latitude when there's nothing bigger from here up to north and, and, and we had full access to it. So, so I remember it being interesting and, and also sad at times as, as many childhoods. Sad. Yes. Uh, so, so in in a sense, that, uh, so if the question was like, how was your childhood? It's a tricky question to me. In in a sense uh, that uh, if I know that uh, that I'm a creator of my own experience in this life, then it was perfect. Um, so in relative, relatively speaking, uh, this is what got me here, and and uh, all the learnings from the childhood were the ones which I believe I wanted to have in this life. But if you put it then on, the, on an absolute scale and, and compared to what you would call normal, then I would call my childhood rather unnormal. Mm -hmm. This uh, reminds me that, uh, well, I won't say all, but most people who are into self-discovery, psychotherapy as an interest area, uh, they're, uh, let's say, so starting uh, setup has been quite challenging, uh, which kind of pushes you then in this road of search. Uh, can you share something? What was in this? What was tough? What was good and positive? Some some of the reflections, so as to give us the feeling of uh, what what are the experiences that you've gathered in your first years. Mm -hmm. So, if maybe to start on 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 the, on the so-called positive side, uh, then uh, like what I already shared, that we were really free to go anywhere, and and uh, that the environment was very very safe. And uh, so I remember going alone swimming, being six years old, six years old without any supervision, and and running around. Uh, around the village or whatever we want to call this place and, uh, and, and not uh, having a care in my life and, and, and also kind of being surrounded with really, really smart people and, and, and uh, state-of-the-art technology and, and we had satellite television before before anyone else in, in, in Estonia and also we had internet before, before anywhere else. So, so there was a lot of uh, uh, positive things and the, the, so the more challenging situations came from, uh, from my own family. Um, and uh, so one of them, for example, uh, being that my mother was a, a alcoholic and my father was a workaholic. <laughs> Uh, so uh, one wasn't available because of the uh, addiction, another one wasn't available because of uh, having to provide for, for the family, even though I, I now think it was more like an escape mechanism rather than, than necessity. 
and and uh, so, so that created a lot of a uh, lot of challenging uh, situations, such as, for example, we didn't have we didn't have any rules or any, uh, nobody to actually enforce the rules on on me and my my sister. So so what then happens typically in these situations is that uh, kids create their own rules um, and their own frameworks, which are typically much stricter than parents would would do it otherwise. So, so you, you start coming up with your own punishments and, and all of that. So, so, so that's, that's what I call the more challenging part. And then also the fact that I was uh, very small in terms of my size. So I, I still am comparably small, but in, in my childhood, I was the smallest one in my class, uh, smallest in size, but also in terms of weight. So kind of having to prove myself all the times and, and also being, uh, being bullied for being small, being bullied for the fact that my uh, mom was an uh, alcohol addict and then also for the fact that we didn't have any money. So, so, so this is what I call the, the maybe not so happy part of the childhood, even though I think that was the very valuable lessons nevertheless. You, you mentioned about that you were surrounded by uh, smart people and uh, I can only assume that as a kid you already also showed like this smartness. So uh, at, at school uh, did you have any like passions and uh, how, how you overall did in, in school? Like, did your smartness had an opportunity to shine kind of on that part? Yes, so I, I, I do believe a part of it is uh, genetics. Uh, so I, I was uh, I went to school very early. Uh, so I graduated. I went to school being five years old, and I went to university being seventeen, uh, with straight A's. Um, so from beginning to the to the end, and, and winning uh, what you call an Olympiads in, in in English or like competitions, and, and mostly in in uh, in. Um, subjects such as math and chemistry and then physics. So I, I didn't excel at languages, really, um, which then somehow I later catched up when I started learning foreign languages in my ad adulthood. Um, but yes, so, so, so this, this did, I think, influence that as well. Um, and also the, the, the possibility to actually ask uh, for, for support from my father, who, who's also a physis physicist, uh, and and uh, so and, and knowing that a lot of other kids didn't have uh, this opportunity at home uh, when we had to solve let's say this extracurricular difficult uh, uh, difficult uh, assignments at home and uh, I enjoyed those uh, very much uh, and, and also I had uh, had help from my father so so yeah I, I do do think that uh, being also kind of surrounded by the environment definitely helped this. Uh, to to bring it to whatever visible or shine or how we want to put it. Mm. So you several times mentioned that childhood uh, was uh, tough but uh, perfect. Uh, what what are some of the impressions that you can give? Like in my childhood, uh, this thing happened, and a positive takeaway for me is such and such. Does something come to your mind in in such a formula? Oh, I, yes, I, many things. Uh, so so I, I think the first one, what comes to my mind is that it doesn't really matter um, where you start, anything is possible. Uh, so I, for example, I, I think I was 20 years old when I was already, my salary was higher than uh, the salary of my father and mother combined. So I worked kind of myself up uh, and so, so this is one. Another one is that uh, I, I saw what the, what the victim life looks like. So my, my, my mom always has been a victim of circumstance. Um, and, and now when I recognize it in myself, then, um, then uh, I, I see where it can lead. So today I'm trying to take the full responsibility of, for, for my own life and not being a victim of circumstance. Uh, and, uh, I also saw how uh, a company uh, was started, uh, learning from my father, as, as when the, the ruble was changed against the Estonian currency, when most of the people in, in this observatory lost jobs. So 80% people were out of jobs uh, overnight. 
and and uh, so my father being one of them uh, then decided to to start the company which is still alive so so i think that that learning came from that period as well but the, the other side of the coin was that he was never home um, but he's very very hard working um, and and uh, i have also pushed myself through a lot of things in my life with with the hard work. So, so there's like kind of a lot of learnings which came from uh, from uh, being where I was. Okay, uh, we will come to later years also. Um, before we leave childhood, Christo, maybe you feel there's something? Yes, uh, I was wondering like uh, you on the same smartness topic you definitely felt like okay I have the straight A's and I can like I have a lot of opportunities. So during the time, uh, did you like what was the future you already envisioned then, like maybe in the in the middle school or or uh, or there, and uh, how is it came, has it came into life? Well, I guess it's a bit difficult to remember. Like when exactly did I wanted to do what? I mean, kind of like where I was already certain that I want to go to the university, but as long as I remember, I, I knew that I will. And and I did also. Uh, so I, uh, I, I, I was interested in technology, and this is what I also learned in, in the uni university. It was computer engineering. So, so in that sense, uh, that I, I think I knew early on, fair, fairly early on. And also already choosing the, the high school uh, was uh, a, a knowing choice uh, we, which one to choose. And, and uh, but for some reason, there always has been a burning uh, to become an entrepreneur. Um, so and that, and that I already knew also being fairly, fairly young. I don't know, maybe maybe just 12 years old. Somehow I, I knew I wanted to create something on my own. So it, it did influence also these, let's say, future choices um, so yeah uh, I, I can assume but I will still ask like and how did you make those choices like you just decided alone that I will go to that high school after that I will go to this university or uh, what what was the decision making process uh, for you back then Yes, so, so I, I, in, in practical terms I, I made these uh, decisions and execution alone. As, as I said, we didn't really have any, any rules in place, uh, so that, that meant that, uh, that whatever, uh, whatever we chose or decided was, uh, was okay. So, so then I did discuss, when I dis discussed it with my father, but he always said that, like, do whatever you want, and, and, and this is what I, what I did. So, so that was a, a kind of choice made, like I would say, Almost alone, I, I, I do think there was also a little bit of uh, social pressure in terms that uh, if you don't go to the university, you don't have as good chances in, in life um, and not knowing really what you want in life being fairly young, uh, then you kind of go with the flow. Um, but it was a kind of a decision in terms of which school to go, or what kind of grades to have, what to learn. Sounds like a well-made choice. Well, we'll see why after I'm dead. <laughs> Let's not, not skip into that part yet. <laughs> I think we have something in the, in the middle also. <laughs> so I understand uh, so that you have uh, had already feeling about what you want to do, but like to be an entrepreneur. Uh, however, there was not a clear plan like I want to be selling fish uh, in wholesale after five years, it wasn't that way, right? Why I thought the fish? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you thought the fish, because this indeed has never crossed my mind. Uh, but, uh, but there was there was certain things which I somehow knew that I always wanted to do. One was, I don't know why, but uh, to work in Germany. Um, and then one was I wanted to do something with uh, with tech, and and, and these, these two things have been always uh, somehow um, very I don't know important or interesting to me. So so in in a sense there wasn't a clear plan like step by step I first need to do that and then but I, I knew that these are the two things I I, I want to do, 
and both things came uh, came true. Uh, but a lot of the things which are for me kind of life changing events um, in general have been uh, serendipity, so kind of uh, a coincidence of circumstances, if you may put so. At, uh, at uh, so I, I, for example, I, my, I met my wife, um, but, but the reason I, I met her was um, uh, what I would call an serendipity. So she ended up uh, being first few weeks going to school from, from where I lived at the moment uh, in, in this village. And the only reason why she was there, because there wasn't, wasn't enough room in the dormitory. But this dormitory room opened up like a few weeks afterwards and, and it so happened that their, their parents knew somebody in that village and it was cl close enough to the school. So there was like a lot of kind of like coincidences on, on the way. Uh, and if any of those wouldn't have been true, I don't think we have ever met. Um, and, and same with my first job was only because I, I decided to wrote an essay, uh, which, which won a national uh, competition. And uh, when I was awarded with an award, I got the job uh, offer on, on the site. Uh, and I remember writing this essay uh, at the very, like, literally last minute. Uh, the submission deadline was uh, Sunday evening, 23.59. And I submitted it uh, 23.55 or something like that. Uh, because I, I, I wanted to do it, but I was lazy. So I thought, no, like, uh, screw it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, but then at the last moment still pull myself together and, and kind of like these like this small steps and all of them had like 100 opportunities to go the other way, uh, which led me finally to, to, to go and work in, in Germany. But if any of those steps would have not happened, then um, it seems at least that opportunity which I got going where would have not been uh, there. So. so there has been uh, choices and there has been a lot of, let's say, opportunities that have kind of presented themselves. So, but then uh, how, how do you see your life up to now? Has it been a chain of uh, random events? Like you put random stuff in a, in a bag and then you do this and pick out randomly and this is your life? Or there's some guiding light line going to it? Well, I, uh, I definitely feel it's a little bit uh, both, but in, in a sense that if I believe that I'm, I'm a creator of my own uh, destiny, or if I, meaning that I choose my, my own destiny, then um, this implies that it's not random. In, in a sense that it's I'm, I'm working in or, well, or like moving towards a certain direction and then uh, things happen uh, regardless. And, and some of these things have influence on my path and some of them have maybe less influence or not, not at all. So, so for me, it's, it's kind of like a mix of, uh, of, uh, of both. Uh, what I call random in, in a sense is that I think what uh, a normal person understands is something which I, I or, or that person doesn't have any control over. Uh, such as uh, uh, my wife to be choosing this particular school is something which I could not control at that moment, but that changed uh, our both uh, both of our lives uh, beyond recognition. So, so, so this is what I would call a random a random event in a sense. But the, the fact that I went and talked to her that was a knowing, knowing choice. So, so it's uh, so, so my part is making these decisions and, and uh, having a freedom to choose, uh, and, and the rest of it is kind of um, let's say let's call it life, not not just like random events in the bag, but uh, but life in general, and then how I react to life. Then it's this is completely up to me to to decide and whether I I uh, kind of use the opportunity and, and, and look what life presents me or I completely ignore it. I can do the both. So, so that's, that's how I kind of currently feel that the world works. I read uh, in uh, one of uh, author Theo Nara's books about meaning versus clarity that uh, if I focus uh, much of my energy on trying to understand the meaning of what's happening around me uh, versus when I try to comprehend what is the next 
best step with the knowledge that I have now. Uh, and the second approach would be more the search for clarity rather than meaning. And he says on the lines that to search for meaning is more or less a waste of time, but to search for clarity is what we should do. Because we cannot grasp the meaning of things uh, because of so many things which we don't see and don't know yet and maybe will never know and understand about our lives. But we, what we can do always is to put in effort to make the next step as uh, sober as possible. Uh, and it feels to me that uh, your approach has been somewhere on these lines. Yes, I, I'm, I can't say that I'm uh, free of, uh, of sin at looking for meaning. So it's, it's just immensely uh, uh, intriguing and interesting to, to try to figure out the meaning of life. Um, and and uh, I really also enjoy this book, Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy, which is talking about meaning of life and, and, yeah. and like all the topics which, which evolve around it. So I, um, uh, but I agree in the sense that, uh, uh, that probably this is uh, um, kind of even beyond our imagination to figure out what the meaning could be, because we only see a very, very small part of it. And then I, I, I do believe that, that life is interconnected, so I can barely grasp with what's happening with me and around me, but there's another billion, billions of people around me participating in the same life. So it is very, very difficult to, or close to impossible to even imagine how this could be interlinked. So, so finding meaning in that uh, uh, seems impossible, but yet uh, very, very kind of, uh, I'm, I'm drawn to the fact that trying to find uh, also meaning in, in uh, events, what happened. But yeah, but the clarity in, 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 in what you describe is, is something which I, I, I think is, is what leads us to, to making decisions. So we look at the information available and also at, at the, the, the feelings and inputs we get from, from people around us and, and also maybe, maybe the world in general. And out of that will men make a decision or, or a next action or something like that. So out of this, uh, so what you call clarity. So it's, it's for me, it's, it's a mixture. Um, but yeah, in terms of uh, making decisions, uh, clarity, of course, always prevails. Meaning is more like, uh, I would say, like almost intellectual exercise. But uh, it's just nice to think about it. But uh, knowing that uh, we will most likely never find out. At one moment when you started uh, this answer, I thought I will tell into camera, stay till the end and Alexander will explain the meaning of life. But now I understood that most probably you're not going to do that. No, it's 42, it's easy. That, that we already heard, yes. Okay. But out of uh, this clarity, somehow you have, like, out of this mixture, you have uh, arrived here where you are right now. So. Maybe you can just first uh, describe with your own words, like what are the main things you are doing now and where you are seeking to, to go with, uh, with this journey. Yes, so today a lot of the things which I'm doing are connected uh, with the search for, I wouldn't say meaning, but, uh, but what we call um, in, in contriver um, a path with the heart, so kind of uh, uh, what is what makes my heart sing and, and uh, what is what I actually came here to do in order to, to take the lessons I, I, I wanted to take from, uh, from, from this world. So, so a lot of it is, is connected with that and, uh, part, and a lot of it is trial and error, trying new things and seeing if that is fit and how does it feel. So, and, and due to this trial and error, so for example, I'm for the last five years or even more, I've been very active in, um, in the investment scene and, and, and we have invested a lot of um, uh, startup companies, so close to 100 today. And, but for today, with, uh, with absolute clarity, I know that this is not the path with the heart for me. Um, uh, even though in, in the contriber, I'm also doing the investment, but with a very different uh, perspective when we when we did it in, in my last investment uh, company. 
So, so, but without trying it out, it would have been very difficult to say if that's a path with the heart for me or not. So, um, uh, so, so this is one. What I do today is is uh, in investments and and how we do it in in Cocoon uh, is is very different um, with how typical uh, venture capital works, for example. And and I enjoy it a lot as as uh, as we provide uh, value through through the Cocoon program and we actually work with founders and not with their business problem, but rather than just looking at the business as, as, a, as a symptom or, or business challenges as a symptom for, for uh, challenges in, in life. And we try to kind of help them to become, um, I wouldn't say a better person, but uh, I would say like a more whole person. Um, so, uh, so, so the value comes through that and not through the investment uh, so much. And, and the investment is just uh, just a tool in our toolbox. So, and, and we enjoy this approach a lot. And we don't have any LPs, and we don't have anyone to report. It's our own money, and it's it's a very very different feeling. And uh, I'm also working as a mentor, which I enjoy a lot. So somehow again, I, this is a very knowing choice. Um, I, I for me, uh, mentoring and, and coaching seems to be one of the things which for me has always been and will always be in, in on my kind of life path so i i, I even already being in uh, in high school uh, i was teaching others and then uh, when i went to the university second uh, second year i was already teaching the first years and i have and, and and this has got somehow continued through my whole life and yeah, I enjoy it a lot and, and, and people come to me to ask for support. So, so this is another thing which I definitely will, uh, will also continue most likely for, for the rest of my life. Okay, so uh, Alex, you mentioned that something about dying and you almost did. So what does it mean? Oh yeah, so, so in, in, uh, when it was time for me to, 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 to leave or, or step back, I guess it's... Uh, uh, so, uh, for me, uh, I, I don't actually know how, how close I was uh, to dying, but I definitely felt that I'm, I'm very close. Uh, so, uh, after working uh, very, very, uh, let's say, vigorously for, for many years, uh, after I started my first, my first company, I came to the point where, uh, uh, what you might call a burnout, it has many names uh, as well, but, uh, but that came with very, very heavy uh, also physical symptoms and, and that ended up me being in, in a hospital with, uh, with extreme chest pains, uh, which, uh, which I thought is my heart uh, stopping, uh, but at least uh, the, the machines didn't show it and I still, uh, still today I'm alive, but... Uh, uh, but feeling wise, I, I, I felt that this is it <laughs> and, and now it's time, time to pack my things. Uh, ho however, uh, this, uh, this did not happen, uh, but, uh, but that was a long journey, uh, which, which started with, uh, with the fact that uh, I, I went into a burnout. So, so and part of it, I guess, is, is the, the fact that I, I stayed for too long doing things which I didn't enjoy anymore. Did you have the feeling already then that you are doing things that you don't enjoy? No. Uh, so for me, it was a wake up call, I guess, somewhere deep inside. Yes, uh, but uh, for me, that was a period uh, in my life where I wanted uh, more, faster, uh, etc. So, uh, so uh, there were a lot of things happening and I was ready to still even start uh, additional things on top of it. But it is so, when I'm uh, approaching the railroad, when I'm driving the car, then there's the sign with three strips and with two strips, then one. Were there such signs before or no? Or it was immediately like stop sign? In, in retro respect, there were a lot of signs. I was just not paying attention. Yes, there, there was not three strips, but I think maybe 20. How, how to recognize them? Well, uh, this is, uh, <laughs> in retro respect, things uh, look much easier to recognize. Uh, but being at the moment, uh, you, uh, you tend to, or I, I at least, uh, disregard them because you don't like what the sign is telling you. 
So, so you're disregarding it. One of the signs were, for example, my relationship with my wife uh, wasn't good at all uh, because I was working all the time. I wasn't at home. We had two little kids and I just ignored it. And instead of uh, trying to make it better, I even worked more. So it just escaped the conversation. Um, so on, on feeling level, I knew that the relationship was not working very well, uh, but I just ignored it. And then uh, also health-wise, I couldn't sleep, for example, but instead of that, I thought, okay, um, I need to increase my physical activity, so I would be more tired in the evening, but, but actually I was overtired. But I, I made myself even more tired because thinking that that will lead me to a better sleep. And, uh, and, and then, uh, of course, drinking alcohol started and, and cigarettes and all of like all, all these things which, which are actually kind of in a retro respect, they are just screaming in your face. But being at that moment, I was, I was absolutely blind to it. And uh, I, I even I, I then later remembered that once uh, while I was working in Germany, um, I had uh, like a panic attack, but I didn't recognize it as such. Uh, so, so the signs were there already many, many, many years before and, and uh, but since I, I, I didn't know what it was and uh, I wake, woke up in the morning and felt uh, good again I wasn't paying attention at all but uh, the first signs I would say were seven to eight years before already quite quite visible. That is indeed so I reflect on my experience also uh, before I got knocked out for around a year for like three years, they were like, boom, then passes half a year, boom, four months pass, boom, but there were small like knocks on the head, but then like, blood dots, <laughs> well, this uh, flew away. So that was what, what, this is how it happens. Histo, how about you? Have you had uh, those knocks and then like big knock on your head? Or it's a head of you? <laughs> no, I think I, I, for, for me, I tend to stop earlier and uh, the biggest signs usually for me is alcohol. Uh, that I very clearly see that uh, the, I start to consume much more uh, often. And then I will just get so tired out of alcohol, meaning I think drinking alcohol is super tiring. <laughs> it will take a lot of energy out. So. I think this is the kind of bottom for me, meaning that I, I just don't want to do anything anymore. That's it, like super passive. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I think this is the tricky part for uh, all of this, that it is so individual, like what are the signs or what is the road or who will start to push even more, who will be passive, who active. So very, very hard to, to tell someone that. Uh, look for those signs. If they are there, then you know where we are heading. But uh, but still, uh, what I have taken out of uh, those experiences is that uh, actually listen others because they are seeing clearer around you. Th those signs uh, in many cases because usually we as people tend to be too close to see. So if you ask someone and he honestly shares, uh, then there is a lot of truth in it usually. But uh, the truth is not something that uh, at least I very often is like pleasurable to hear. Like it's like I don't like it. Meaning then you don't get it. If I don't like it, then it must be wrong. I now remember signs in, in my life have been in two categories. One is uh, the obvious one, health, uh, body is uh, giving signals, so for you it was uh, the same. But another category, um, scientists uh, will probably switch off now the recording, uh, was uh, things around me breaking apart uh, and that happening more and more often. Stuff happening with my car and with various glass, uh, uh, glass, uh, things made out of glass. Uh, has anything like this been also in your radar or none such experiences? No, actually a lot of them. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, so for example, at the, at the time where, where I, I was kind of like very 
getting already very, very close to the point where, where uh, it, it all break down, uh, that the pressure all of a sudden went immensely, like exponentially up. And uh, uh, so what I know today or what I believe today is that, that uh, if, if you, let's say, look at the, the world uh, as a as something which is not there at all, but something which uh, has its own agenda and, and, and life and you're part of the bigger life and, uh, and that the world has a tendency to, to actually uh, uh, guide us and, and help us. And, and so these uh, uh, things which happen around us uh, a lot of the times are actually world trying to point our kind of attention to a certain direction. And so how it happened with me was that um, that uh, at the at the busiest times at, at the work and when things were not working with my, with my wife, we were sued <laughs> by by somebody who who bought our apartment um, and and that was a very very nasty nasty court case uh, as as they uh, they seized our assets and and all all kinds of nasty stuff happened so so so. so uh, so this happened just before that uh, that the volume went very very loud so kind of like if you're not listening I'm, I'm gonna talk louder so so the, so the volume was so high that it was not uh, possible not to hear and then of course yes sometimes it's it, it, it even appears in, in in a sense that like literally things uh, start to break down uh, your health first but then secondly also physical stuff uh, such as uh, so we lately me and my wife, we, we have went through uh, some um, uh, difficulties and, and uh, at the same time at, at our home, things have been breaking down one after the other and, and the most mysterious things, which, which never break, uh, uh, like washing machines and toasters and, and usually these things last for 30 years and they just break down one after the other and then we had a leak on the roof, but the roof is completely uh, fine, but yet we had water coming in from, uh, from the ceiling and there's, there's nothing, there's no holes and anything, but just water drips from a place where it cannot, cannot theoretically be. And, 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 and we even draw a hole through it and, uh, and, and it has a, a insulation on top of it. The insulation is uh, completely dry. But yet you have water dripping from the ceiling. So, so, so like, uh, and, and car accidents and, and so a lot of things which kind of uh, have not worked during the time of stress. So, so uh, yes, I, I do see it happening. And this uh, gives me uh, a picture of, uh, um, would be good uh, to interesting to make an experiment of putting the dots of uh, things happening in a timeline and then you see when there are more dots and then you can also correlate it with how you feel about things around and it could be so that the, those external dots correlate with uh, the feelings inside also and this way we wouldn't lose the scientific audience also for <laughs> the podcast. Um, um, so uh, we got now into the area of uh, uh, speaking about the various types of challenges. Uh, can you reflect uh, you um, and challenges in your life two to three years ago compared to how it's now? Um, is, is there such a feel that, okay, when I look back, then I had this and these and these challenges and today I have resolved them and I can feel the difference? Hmm. Um, this is a good question as, as I think uh, that, that the real challenges uh, most likely were uh, were similar or at least somewhat similar. But I was just looking at challenges at very very face value, meaning that, so for example, uh, being uh, being in a court case, uh, not having a good relationship with with my uh, with my wife. Uh, we lost the co-founder. In, in the company, we were struggling fundraising. Um, I was in between, uh, so, so we ran out of money in between uh, two funds. And so, so, so these seem to be like the challenges which were happening two, three years ago. Um, and, and today, uh, and, and, but we are like all face value. So, so what was like, like, like more, like almost like a symptom. Um, and uh, today, if I'm talking about the challenges, I'm more talking about what is not the face value, but kind of what is the under the face value. And for me, 
one of the challenges I'm tackling today is, is uh, forgiveness. Uh, it's very difficult for me to forgive people. And it was definitely present also three years ago. I just was not thinking it from that perspective. I, I thought that I have always done everything right and everybody around me are wrong. If, if there's a conflict or something like that. Uh, today I'm seeing it always first looking at uh, what I'm contributing to the conflict and, and uh, so what I have to learn from it. Uh, another challenge is uh, self-importance, for example. I'm, back then it was definitely present, uh, but I just didn't perceive it in, in, in that sense. And, and this court case, uh, I think, would have not happened if I would uh, uh, have listened, actually, and, and not thought back from the, the perspective of uh, being right always. So today I'm just defining it as a, as a challenge of being self-important. And then looking at things what happen that, okay, so am I now, what kind of position I'm taking here? Am I acting out of self-importance or, or am I not acting out of self-importance? So, so, so kind of, in a sense, I would say it has gone much more personal and much more abstract, in a sense, abstract meaning that, uh, that it, not looking at the symptom, but just looking at if this is a symptom, what is when the disease causing this symptom. So in, in that sense, I'm looking at it completely differently, but I'm not, uh, or I'm, I'm actually quite convinced that the challenges itself have been uh, similar as a lot of them take, uh, well, maybe tens and tens of years to, to, uh, to solve or overcome. So if I hear correctly, then you have something in your life which uh, you register as uh, unpleasant, for example, a court case, and then uh, three years ago you would look at this is the problem and I need to win in the court case. And now you look at it and you say, okay, this is a symptom of something, and then what is the disease, what is the personal challenge that I have? And then you come down to, uh, as you used in your example, self-importance. But uh, like, how can you do this? Like, I can't imagine that I would sit uh, at my desk and look, uh, there's my external thing and how do you roll it back what's the process how do you find it and, and also a question what do you do with it because okay self-importance uh, what's next mm -hmm. um, well this is a very good question so to me it didn't happen uh, by itself or naturally so for me this came with uh, with help so I uh, I was looking for uh, for I don't know advisor or coach or mentor and I found one uh, which helped me to actually see this other perspective because I was I was completely uh, I was angry uh, at, at this other person for example in the case of the court case I, I was definitely felt uh, victimized by this other person I felt life is unfair and and uh, he said well this is all fine but uh, if uh, if you now bring it back to yourself so so what does it say about you and it was a it was a quite long process it took me I think about six months work. Uh, with myself and with the mentor and, 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 and with people around me to realize that what the challenge was at that moment for me was actually not taking responsibility for my own actions. So, and, and, uh, so it, doesn't ha it doesn't really work so easily that I sit behind the table and, and I, I figured it out, but uh, it does get easier if you do this process again and, and again and again and, and you start uh, uh, grasping it much much faster so so today since I've done it for quite a while already so some of the things I know right away okay so okay so again I'm not trusting life I'm resisting and and, and that's why I'm, I'm getting this uh, this pushback or, or seeing this symptom uh, symptom again uh, but one thing I guess is asking uh, for, first of all is asking this very same question. So this, if this is just a symptom, what is then the real challenge? So even just by asking that question, I think you make a huge step forward. And then the next uh, next question for me would be that, okay, so if, um, if this challenge isn't what it appears to be, so why am I facing it? So what I have to learn from this experience and, and if I have already learned everything uh, fighting back, for example, then maybe this time it's, uh, it's uh, my opportunity not to fight back. And, and I don't know, I either accept what, uh, what the other person is saying. or so, so, so kind of looking at what I have to win in, in this situation. And I don't mean like monetarily, but I mean on, on, on personal level. 
So you said that you went and spoke with a mentor. Um, and then you also said that it's important to, uh, useful to talk with someone else. I remember Ray Dalio in his book Principles writes that uh, beware with whom you go to speak to because whomever you ask a question, he will give you an answer. Uh, so <laughs> ask those people whose answers you, you really need. Mm -hmm. how, how do you pick a mentor? What was your approach? Uh, so, yes, for me it was almost uh, um, mystical <laughs> meaning, but uh, that once I was uh, faced uh, with uh, with the burnout and all the symptoms and and, and the effects which came with it, uh, uh, when I wanted to kind of reach out, I was thinking, so who I know, um, uh, in, out of people who who I could talk to and ask for advice or ask for help or, or support, and um, uh, and I picked few people, and uh, so, so somehow I knew exactly who to ask. So I, 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 uh, the, the thinking process, who to ask for support, was was like super short, maybe only seconds. And but I started like very, very around the corner, like hey, uh, you know, I I have had so, so this bit bit of the rougher period, and I may maybe now experiencing some uh, some physical symptoms. Have you had anything like that uh, ever? And it was a hundred percent match. Uh, so the people who I, I contacted back then, um, in, in the beginning, uh, they all have had, even though I didn't know it, um, have had uh, very, very, very similar experiences. So, so this is where I got a lot of encouragement uh, to, to look further. And but this, this is what I wouldn't call mentoring yet. This is more like a support. And, uh, and uh, when I... Uh, I ran into rain on the street and then I remembered, okay, but uh, wasn't rain uh, doing something like, well, like working with mentors and specifically working with founders, not mentors, but uh, working with founders and specifically uh, focusing on, on uh, let's say, hardworking uh, and, and very, let's say, extreme environments such as a startup environment tends to be. And then I asked rain, hey, you know, uh, I've been kind of, working a lot and, and, and maybe now thinking maybe I shouldn't work as much. Again, very, very, because I was very uncomfortable talking about it. I, I thought this is a completely taboo and, and, and you shouldn't, you should ever, never tell somebody that uh, you are in, in trouble. That was still my state of mind at that moment. And he said, yeah, of course, you know, um, this is what I'm doing. And then, then this is how my relationship with Rain started. So I knew him professionally before, but we didn't have a relationship. And Rain is who? Uh, well, Rain, Rain was my mentor and, and still is. Um, and, and, but today we are also co-founders. So Rain is a founder of Cocoon. So this is how, how he started. So the Cocoon was, was created to, uh, to be a mentoring program for startup entrepreneurs, but not mentoring programs in terms, program in terms of how accelerators do it. But the mentoring pro program, so it's called like almost psychology. So, so startup founders, psychology, so working on founders instead of uh, working um, uh, with specific uh, business problems. So we, this was kind of where uh, how Rain created, uh, created Cocoon and, and uh, our roads passed at the perfect moment in a sense that, uh, that there, there was one uh, masterclass coming up that, that was like a few weeks before me went. And so Rain invited me that masterclass where I learned a lot about myself. So this is how the journey started somehow. Um, and then, uh, then Rain became my, my mentor and, and, and was for a very long time. Uh, so how to pick one is I would just, I don't have a better advice than to trust your feeling about it and, and also trust the world at least so much that, uh, that uh, if, if you start actively looking for something, I can promise you will find exactly what you need at that moment. So, but the act of looking is still important, uh, meaning putting an active um, uh, intent and putting, uh, uh, putting it also in, into action, meaning not sitting in the couch thinking I need a mentor and hoping that one walks in from the door, but knowing that now if I start looking, I, I will actually find what I'm looking for. So, so for me, uh, that process was very smooth, but I actually had to reach out to people and also make myself uh, open and talk about my experiences. So, 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 so that, that's how I found it. And I, I think that's something which, which will work 100% of the time. 
And uh, now I can imagine that after this, uh, those years working with mentor and uh, on yourself, you are uh, like on a very everyday work. You are not putting in as much hours as you did before the burnout. Am I correct? Yes, I, I think I've reduced it like 50%, something like that. And uh, how much worse is your life now? Because logically, the more you work, the better it is. And now you are working less. So how much worse is your life? Oh, it's, it's, uh, uh, well, obviously, obviously there's only one answer uh, uh, that, that life is much better. But at the same time, I've also came to a realization that it, it never was about hours. So it's, it's not actually, um, I think some people can easily work 80 hours uh, a week and, and feel fulfilled and be happy and, and achieve all their goals. This is, this is just not my path. Um, in, in a sense. And uh, so I, I don't think it's, it's, it's really about the number of hours, unless you work yourself to exhaustion. I mean, you, you still need to sleep and there are certain things which, which you have to do, such as eat and, and sleep and relax. And, uh, but it, we can't say that 35 is good or 65 is bad. I don't believe, uh, be, believe that anymore. Uh, but definitely, if I take my personal case, I was uh, I was way, working uh, way too many hours, and uh, today it's it's much much less, and and I, I feel actually much more fulfillment from life, and, uh, and and also now the focus has shifted from from trying to create the most profitable business into something which I just enjoy doing, um, and and trying to do it profitable. But if the profit doesn't come, it's okay. Uh, and, and it doesn't make me sad if, if I enjoy the process and also being focused more on, on, on the family and, and putting now a lot of my attention, uh, attention on relationships. So, so yeah, the long answer, but that's, that's how I feel. So you, you believe that it is possible to build uh, the, the right business for you or for every person to, to build the right person for him or her without uh, like being uh, for like for at least like three or five years in this kind of feeling that I'm I don't have enough time or I'm super tired and because uh, I'm, I'm constantly seeing those founders who are uh, telling that it is the only way. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's, I, I would say again, this is a, this coin has two sides, if not, not more than two sides. So I, I do uh, think that how this world is set up is that if you want to deliver exceptional results, then it, you need to put in a lot of work. So, so it's, it's, it's not, um, um, it's not likely to happen that if you, you, if you just say that I'm working half an hour a week, but I'm really focused for this half an hour, it's just half an hour will never be enough. So it's, it's uh, in, in, in certain terms, uh, absolutes are an argument in a sense that, um, that if you just, if I'm not calling my customers, then I will never have customers. And, and to, in order to call my customers, I need to put in a lot of hours. So, so, so. It's, it's, you can't say that um, uh, you can do a world changing things in half an hour a day. Um, so, so this is very likely not uh, going to happen. But where I think this burnout is coming from is, is from the fact that we have a very certain imagination what the success looks like. And, and, and mostly we put the monetary value on success. So if, I'm, if I don't have a million on my bank account, that means I'm, I'm successful. Because uh, there's another startup founders who have earned millions and I haven't, so I, I must be unsuccessful. So I, I think there's a lot of other uh, measurements uh, to term what uh, success looks like. And for me, today, uh, I, I feel successful if I have people around me who I uh, want to have around me, uh, regardless of whether it's uh, and, and how much uh, it brings in uh, money wise. So very, very different criteria of measuring my success. And I also feel successful if I'm um, courageous enough to tackle my challenges and not to run away from them. And then I feel, okay, if I'm today, instead of uh, hiding from the conflict, I actually initiated it 
and 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 they learned something out of it. I feel it was a successful day, and and earlier it would have been a terrible day for me if I had a conflict. So so kind of like shifting shifting focus of what success looks like. I think is the is the formula, and also letting go of this uh, uh, whatever we want to call it, uh, social conditioning or 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 this this idea that. Uh, everybody has to build a billion dollar companies. I don't think it's necessary at all. Uh, but in order to build billion dollar companies, you most likely have to work 80 hours a day. I don't think this happens overnight. Um, the question is whether this is something which makes you happy or not. And I think in most cases, the answer tends to be not. Then I feel we are arriving to final questions or question. Um, I, I uh, have impression that you have accumulated a lot of experience and you have also learned from this experience because it's also uh, perfectly possible to accumulate experience and not to learn from it, <laughs> but not your case. Uh, can you share uh, what are some of those uh, most important things that you now know? Mm -hmm. from your own experience that could be useful for others to know. I know that people pr uh, prefer to learn from their own experiences, but still uh, there's a, there is possibility that we can also learn from others' experiences. So can you share? Uh, yes. Uh, so maybe few ones which are uh, like almost obvious, um, but still a um, lot of us we don't uh, put them into practice, uh, including myself, or at least uh, 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 an earlier version of myself. And one, for me, one of these experiences was taking responsibility for your own life. And it, it, sounds, it sounds very abstract, but in reality, this just means that uh, coming out of this bloody victim uh, mode and, and feeling uh, that somebody, feeling hard done by, feeling that uh, life is unfair, um, and, and taking responsibility for your own experience, meaning that, and, and how you do it in, in, in the situations where you feel hard done by is, is asking this very same question. Like, so if this is about me and my experience, what am I learning here? And you constantly, and, and in, like in, in instantly take yourself out of a victim, uh, victim mode and start actually going into learning, learning mode. So this is for me, one of the biggest learnings is take, taking responsibility. Uh, another one is actually listening to what the world is trying to tell you and, and listening. And, and I mean, sometimes literally it's telling me something in, in the format of my wife saying that, hey, you work too many hours and it doesn't work. And, and actually listening to and, and, and not taking at the face value either, right? So, so sometimes people, people try to manipulate with you and, and, and it doesn't make it less valuable what they are bringing. They just have their own agenda. Um, and, and just like literally listening um, and not, uh, not hiding uh, away or running away from, uh, from what they're bringing you just because you don't like what they say. So this is one of the, and then the third one, so if I choose, these are the two main ones for me. And then the third one, I'm just thinking there's actually so many, I, I wanted to say trust life, but this, this is very, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to pick trust life as, as last one. But, uh, and what I mean by trust life is that uh, whatever situation you find yourself, trusting life means that uh, I believe that I have the means and knowledge and, and necessary, let's say, energy and tools to come out of it alive and, and, and to manage the situation. So for me, this is one way of trusting life. And another way of trusting life is also kind of not resisting what these and, and by resisting means oh, oh, these are for me always uh, occasions where I feel offended by somebody, for example. And, and another thing which also the resistance sometimes comes is in form of anxiety. So if you feel anxiety, then it's very likely you're resisting something. Or if you feel being late somewhere, it's very likely that you're resisting something. So, so kind of trusting life and, and, and taking life as it is rather than trying to push your own uh, own agenda and, and, and trying to live life on your conditions. So I, I would pick these three. Thank you.